Hi. Hi again. Thanks for joining me. I'm here to give a brief update on what I've been getting into, what I've been reading and finishing in the last week or so after I finished those big books. I wasn't reading those big books, meaning Anna Karenida and The Magic Mountain by themselves. Uh, they were very slow reads, but I had some other things going in the background. Anyway, it's a gray and rainy day after some really nice days, so I'm not complaining. It's been um, super unseasonably warm in the last couple of days and sunny. I think a couple videos ago I mentioned that I started taking a knitting class, which is basically the owner of this lovely shop nearby has like this knitting group at different times of the week and you could be an experienced knitter and you just want to sit with other knitters or maybe you're working on a project and it has a hole in it or something and you need Carol to help you, whatever. And she gives uh, knitting lessons while you're there with the other lovely people that I met. So that's what we did. This was like a week ago. And right now I'm just practicing. She taught me knitting and purling immediately, which I've never known how to purl. I've known how to do a knit stitch. And I showed her how I'm used to holding the needles, how I'm used to knitting. I wasn't clear whether I was a left-handed or a right-handed knitter. I think I'm a left-handed knitter, but I do move the needles in a weird way. You know, we left-handers really don't do very many things in a standard way. But this is my practice knitting, which yeah, it should look like this. I've got these extra, uh, what are these? I don't know, lines. I don't know what they're called. Rows. And whenever I got more than like 19, you know, I'd go back to 19, whatever. But it's like purling and stitching. I don't know which one's purling and which one's sti stitching, like what it, I mean, knitting, whatever it looks like. But anyway, I'm going to go back to Carol uh, when I can in about in a couple days and yeah she's going to continue to help me it's really fun it's really relaxing i had to go somewhere this weekend on a plane and i took this with me even though it was going to be this really quick trip with things that we had to do and i found that in between uh, the doing things i was able to just knit a couple minutes in the airbnb but i actually knitted in the airport and I knitted on the plane which I wasn't planning on didn't think about except I put the bag in my backpack and there it was so that was pretty cool thing to experience while I was listening to or uh, yeah I was what, uh, listening to a podcast okay what have I finished I was, I took on that trip with me, the Anita Brook, Bruckner, A Closed Eye, and this turned out to be just the perfect thing. I am now a real fan of traveling with an Anita Bruckner. And this was a good one because I did not know what was going to happen. It has to do with Harriet and her husband and her friend Tessa, who eventually marries a guy named Jack. They're she is definitely friends with Tessa and with Jack, but more so with Tessa. And Jack's a interesting figure that Tessa admits she knew when she married him that he was just going to keep on doing what he was doing. And I don't know what he does for a living, but he's flying around a lot. He's gone a lot. She knew that. And uh, she had a baby. Harriet has a, uh, let me try to get this right. She has a daughter named Imogen, Imogen. And Tessa's daughter is Lizzie. They are very different people. And because Tessa sometimes wants to go with Jack or sometimes wants to run around and do things, Lizzie ends up spending a lot of time with Imogen and with Harriet. And that's an interesting dynamic. But I'll, I'll tell you what, this has such complexity in it. It's, I'd say, a little more edgy, a little more complex. And yet it's still the same gentle expert writing that you would expect in an, in an Anita Bruckner. Just the thing to take with me on this sort of hectic, 
a uh, very task driven weekend um, that I went on. So yeah, I highly recommend this. I just picked this up when I was in um, Portland, Maine at that used bookstore. So really happy I had that with me. And then I got out of the library or I just finally got on a hold erasure, erasure by Percival Everett. This, this book was written in 2001, but it was just recently republished probably because of the upcoming movie or the movie called American Fiction. And this is republished by Grey Wolf Press. I saw the trailer of the movie, so I kind of knew what the story would be about. Thelonious, quote unquote, Monk Ellison. So he goes by Monk Ellison is the main character. He's a professor. He's not a very happy person and he's trying to get published. He has been published, but not well. He's a black man. He is seeing his, um, he is seeing other black authors. Now this is 2001 and it, I, I'm hoping the publishing industry has evolved. It feels like it has, but in, when this was written and then published in the late nineties, 2001, it's, we're in a setting where he's seeing black authors around him being successful. If they're writing stories that white audiences want to read, which typically have to do with poor urban black youth in, in gangs and struggling and very uh, ghettoized and talking in a, um, a, a real vernacular ghetto genre type writing. He's seeing, uh, they, they talk about one particular female black author in this, in this book and he just has enough of it. If you see the trailer of the movie, I'm assuming it's very close to, uh, it seems like it's keeping very close to this book. It's interesting because the book that Monk writes, of course it's satirical. The whole, a lot of this book is satirical. I love how he drops in these satirical moments, but then he fully realizes Thelonious or Monk as a person with a 365 degree life with a mother and a sister and a brother and his love life or attempts at a love life, his career and how that's going. So he's fully realized and that part isn't too satirized. Like it's, it, it, I feel, I feel like he's playing that one straight. And then there's other parts that get like super satirized. It's just, it's just such a great experience. I, I mean, this, the story just knows no bounds. I mean, if it, it just like personifies to me, it seems like, oh yeah, this is the person that is capable of writing a book like the trees, but this was 20 some years ago. It's fascinating. I, I really recommend, um, I really recommend this read. And at the moment I'm reading a Dorothy Whipple. If one of you booktubers who are watching this read this recently, Dorothy Whipple's Someone at a Distance, please remind me because I can't remember where I saw this. It was it on Bookstagram or Booktube. I don't know, but it was one of them. So I don't remember who, or maybe it was a group of people read this book that put it on my radar so much. There's a couple of Bookstagrammers that I want to reach out to and look back and ask and also ask to see if they read this because whatever it was they were talking about, I immediately ordered this from the library. It's a Persephone. It's beautifully done. They call this Persephone classics. This was, um, this particular version was published in like 2008 and I'm still reading it, but it's about a family, Ellen and Avery. They're well to do English, English living in the country and they have two children, Hugh and Anne. And it says they have two children and live in the rural commuter belt outside London. When his mother, Avery's mother, advertises for a companion, the French girl who arrives sets her sights on Avery. Well, that simplifies this story. Like I was thinking that was just gonna be a main part of the story. And it is a part of the story for sure. I mean, 
the book does turn into that. But there's so much before that. You really get to know Louise, the uh, French young woman, and what her motives are, what's in her head. Um, and then when there's more involvement with, you know, how does Louise even get into the company of Avery? How is she exposed to Avery? That's a whole thing. And then we get to see a side of Avery, like I'm still in this, in this moment of like figuring things out, like what, uh, where is this book going? I love this writing. So anyone that's a fan of Dorothy Whipple, I now have to know, like, is there a book of hers that's close to this? Because I don't think she wrote a whole lot of them based on this list of books. So I haven't read the introduction, which I'm really eager to read after I finish the book. I, I am like so delighted to be reading uh, to be reading a Dorothy Whipple because I could have another author on my hands that I would like to read more of. So let me know if there's a book of hers that's similar, like, or are they all in the same? Like her writing is, is beautiful. It's not floral. And yet it's, there's something different about it than an Anita Bruckner. It's, I don't want to even say formal. It's plain speaking, but she just has this way of bringing the characters to life without being verbose or flowery. It's just like the perfect balance. So yeah, I'm really enjoying this. I have like a quarter of the way to go. So what might I be turning to next? Well, I know at least one book I'm going to try or maybe two. I don't really do a lot of talking about what I'm going to read next anymore because I just don't ever know. Even though I might have my eyes set on something, I could just change my mind in a second. But I will say that now that it's been enough time, I am going to try Edith Wharton's Summer, which is supposed to be the quote unquote hot Ethan Frum. Now that it's been enough time since I've read, um, what was it? House of Mirth and high New York society. I think now I can try reading this Western Massachusetts setting for a rural, I suppose, uh, setting of that book. And then I mentioned in another video that I got on hold Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings, which I want to try. I read a couple pages of this and yeah, it looks interesting. I don't know how it'll go. I'll, I'll give it a try. When I was picking this up it was uh, at lunchtime and the international booker long list had just been announced i noticed the time and i thought oh i'm here at the library they've just announced the long list let's see if the library just happens to have on the shelves in the international fiction any of those books and they did have one of them and it is undiscovered by gabrielle wiener Gabrielle Wiener, translated from the Spanish by Joya Sanchez. This looked interesting and it is pretty short, so I'm going to try it. Um, you may have already heard what some of these books are about, so I'm not going to go into it because I don't know if I'm going to try it. But it says, a home in a museum, alone in a museum in Paris, Gabriella Wiener confronts, wait, is that the author? Weird. Gabriella Wiener confronts her complicated family heritage. She's visiting an exhibition of pre-Columbian artifacts, spoils of European colonialism, many stolen from her homeland of Peru. It says an award-winning Peruvian journalist and writer delivers her stunning English breakthrough in an autobiographical novel that explores colonialism through one woman's family ties to both the colonized and colonizer. Huh, all right. I, I don't know where I saw this on booktube or bookstagram. Let me know if you're one of those people that have read this, this book with a stunning cover called I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Harpman. It has an afterword by Sophie McIntosh, which I've taken a look at, but I haven't, um, I haven't read yet. And it's translated by Ross Schwartz. And it's such a beautiful cover. I've read like the first 40 pages of this and it's mesmerizing. Like I am not a dystopian world reader. 
that is not attractive to me. And yet here I am. Jacqueline Hartman, by the way, was born in Belgium in 1929 and fled to Casablanca with her family during World War II. Informed by her background as a psychoanalyst and her youth in exile, I, who have never known men, is a haunting, heartbreaking, post-apocalyptic novel. It's so mesmerizing and so... It, it, the, the prose just drew me in right away. Um, the, the afterword that I had started reading by Sophie McIntosh actually says the prose is cool water because the setting feels so real and so possible. I think maybe that's it. Deep underground, there's a sticker here so I can't read all of it, but there are some women imprisoned in a cage can't really tell it's a cage though it just feels like it's a cave that they're imprisoned in watched over by guards the women have no memory of how they got there no notion of time and only a vague recollection of their lives before there's a young girl at the center of this story I th is she a, a narrator yeah she's the 40th prisoner she sits alone and outcast in the corner soon she will show herself to be the key to others escape and survival um, that's, she's already gotten herself out of the corner and she's starting to engage with some people, even though that's not her normal way of being. Uh, yeah, I'm mesmerized, I have to say. For this person, this reader who, that doesn't like post-apocalyptic or, uh, dystopian sci-fi, sci-fi at all, really, um, this is snagged me so far it's my update for this week please let me know what you're getting into yeah again i this is what these are the ones i may get into that's the edith wharton and this is the one that i want to know about from any of you the dorothy whipple let me know please join in the conversation in the comments. So thank you so much for the engagement and I hope to see you on the next one.